flashes, huh? What's your favorite scary movie? <laughs> um, not that one. <laughs> Welcome back to Micro Queers. It's a special bonus episode because you all fucking asked for it. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace. And yes, you did all ask for it. And we are late to this party. But yes. we are discussing the first season of AMC's Queer as Fuck interview Ooh. with the vampire. Indeed. Yes. Um, let's do our usual Patreon thing, Trace. Do you recommend this show? Hell to the yes. I I confess, because you don't go back and listen to our interview with the vampire episode on the film, but like, I I like it. It's not like, mm -hmm. I, I don't have a huge connection to this franchise or yeah. Anne Rice for that matter. So no. I, this wasn't high on my watch list, even though I heard it was good. It was nothing against like the show itself. It just like, it wasn't screaming out to me. Sure. Boy, oh boy, was I hooked after this first episode. So, um, <laughs> yes, recommend. And as we will discuss, there are plenty of things I remember. I should point out, though, everyone, I did binge this about a month ago. So mm -hmm. we're going to see how much I remember. <laughs> there we go. Yes. And I'm in the fortuitous position of having just marathon this because we decided, hey, people keep asking. We should try to do it. We should get caught up before season two. So I'm coming at this a little bit fresher. I just finished this yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I will also strongly recommend this. I found it had a bit of a slow start it didn't really mm -hmm. hook me like i enjoyed it but i didn't love it for the first two episodes and then i think just like a lot of the people on the internet did the minute that claudia shows up i was yeah. like bam i need to watch all of these episodes immediately it's it's a thing where i, I the tone of the show is so interesting because i feel like almost every episode has a different tone but mm -hmm. it was it was that first claudia centric episode where i was like oh this feels like a romantic comedy almost where it's like these two gay men having to like form a life together with like mishaps and pratfalls <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and i like how it traces the trajectory of their relationship right like there's the meet cute in episode one and obviously we do end it by turning louis into a vampire and then we've got to spend a couple of episodes just establishing how are they going to function as a couple as they adjust to both being vampires and then we throw the kid into the mix because of course louis is sad he can't go and be with his family anymore so we adopt a surrogate daughter and then shit goes off the rails absolutely and i think honestly one of like in general one of the most interesting things about this show is that as an adaptation I think there was an easy way that this could have gone very wrong and pissed oh, off God, a bunch yeah. of fans. And, you know, it's like, well, that's not how it is in the book. But I think the mm -hmm. show does a really good job of being a fairly straightforward adaptation of the book. But the changes it makes make sense. They feel organic. And it's interesting. It doesn't feel... Oh, God, like, it doesn't feel shitty, I guess. It's like the eloquent thing I want to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that you're talking about it as an adaptation, because have you read the book or did you just look up some of the things it was doing a little different? I, you know, I read most of the first book in high school. So okay. the memory is not there. But I know the basic outlines of the story because I do think that original film, themes aside and queerness aside, is a fairly mm -hmm. straightforward, again, adaptation of that book. Okay. Yeah, because obviously the TV show, it's seven episodes. Most of these episodes are coming in around 50 minutes. So yeah. there's a lot of room to play with. We can cover a lot of distance. I was actually surprised at where we don't go in the show. Like, they're telling a relatively contained story. We don't leave New Orleans for the most part. We're not doing extensive flashbacks or anything. So we're very much keeping it in the present even though I think we're covering about 30 plus years over the course of the season, because at one point, Claudia in the finale says that she's 33 years old. Yes, but I think that's actually really smart, because I think if you overload this story with with flashbacks, it's it just becomes too bogged down in exposition. And I mm -hmm. almost like that we're kind of on this journey with Louis and Claudia. But also, I mean, they're clearly saving a lot of that stuff for yes. future seasons. And it mm -hmm. keeps Lestat mysterious, because even though... I feel like I haven't paid. Something will happen. And I'm like, I don't. I don't know you quite well enough yet. Well, I'm not going to lie. I think the show takes some really big swings in the last couple of episodes. And it goes to places I was not expecting, mm -hmm. particularly around the reveal of what Lestat can and cannot do. Oh, my God. The flying episode where he just drops Louie. It's heartbreaking, right? It's uh, I'm going to go on record. 
episode five is my absolute favorite of the season so that's the episode where we get the flying and also where claudia comes back and we're doing like we gotta kill the stat yes which okay did you think we were well, i guess you wouldn't because we know that the actress that plays claudia has been recast for season mm-hmm. two but i can imagine if you were watching this before like, when it was airing if you were like i guess we're gonna kill claudia this season but well i was gonna say we don't meet armand yet but we do <laughs> <laughs> oh boy yeah okay Let, let's backtrack because yeah. i don't want to jump right to the end because there's so many good things at the yeah. beginning why don't we tackle our appreciation or maybe not of some of these characters so let's start with eric bogosian as daniel malloy the titular interviewer because that's really where the first couple of episodes do a lot of exposition right so we introduce this writer he is dealing with parkinson's disease he's kind of in a fallow period for his career and then he gets a series of tapes and an interview to come to dubai and interview louis de pont de lac who is played by jacob anderson oh man uh it's so funny so when i started this show i think it opens with like kind of a news piece on the daniel malloy character but i I was watching this on Amazon Prime and I bought the season. I just assumed it was an ad for like some news broadcast. And then, <laughs> and then they started, then I was like, oh, wait, I think this is the show. <laughs> mm-hmm. See, I knew it was the show immediately because I was like, oh, my God, Eric Bogosian, he is the teacher from Gossip, which I'm still going to make you talk about oh, with me one day. But he he always plays this kind of smarmy, jerky, wounded character. And I think he is so good at at playing this kind of character oh absolutely and i think one of the best decisions the show makes in an adaptation change is that they've already met before it is established because yes. daniel malloy is not a young 20 something christian no. slater in this in this show he met louis back in what the 70s i think they say yes. um and yeah so this is a re-interview for them which i think immediately is kind of like all right show i'm getting mm-hmm. on your wavelength yeah they've got a history it's interesting just how much work we're doing to distinguish louis like i'm not gonna lie i do think that jacob anderson is my favorite performer Uh i really love bailey bass as claudia i'm going to be very heartbroken when i have to adjust to a new actor in season two right but i think that jacob anderson has the hardest role to play because he needs to be an innocent very religious closeted character in that first episode he's got to deal with new vampirism in the second episode but all the time we're seeing him in the contemporary pieces when he's talking to daniel malloy his affectation the way he delivers dialogue is completely different and you really get the sense of how old he is as a result no i i, I agree with you 100 percent. i think jacob anderson is like kind of the breakout of this show and mm-hmm. i mean again if you remember when we when we talked about the film we kind of talked about how again louis the brad Pitt Pitt character is kind of a He's sad so sack. whiny. <laughs> yes, so whiny. And th- this Louis is still following those same beats. I mean, again, mm-hmm. it's the same character for the most part, but so much more interesting though. I agree. And maybe it's because we have, you know, seven hours instead of two hours to flesh right. out this part of Louis. But yeah, I, I would agree that this to me is an improvement over the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like there is no boring protagonist syndrome going on here, which is definitely how I felt in the film version. Like Tom Cruise is outshining Brad Pitt so much right. in that movie. Whereas here, I I was constantly drawn to Louis and his just his struggle to adapt. Even as he becomes the negotiator of peace between Claudia and Lestat, like I think that sam reed is doing okay as lestat i will confess i don't love his accent and it really bothered me for the first couple of episodes until i kind of adjusted to it Mm -hmm. but i mean i think their chemistry as a couple the sex oh all of the parenting stuff like they are really really good together as performers i joe the sex in the the show i Fuck me hard in this show. Oh, my God. I mean, again, I I knew that this show was going to be more explicitly queer when I was going into it, but I wasn't really expecting this. I, yeah, I mean, it's, Mm -hmm. it's hot as fuck. Um, But again, it. but then there's punctuations of humor, you know, like when when yeah. they have their kind of first lovers spat and then we just cut to the coffins and we just hear like Lestat's muffled voice like, I don't like going to bed angry. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, it, it feels so wise to the intricacies of queer relationships. And I do love that we acknowledge Lestat is more bisexual than gay. I would say pansexual. Well, there there is that. Yeah, he's definitely he's equal everything opportunity. So yes, he's not discriminatory. 
Yeah. Whereas, you know, Louis is very much a closeted gay man. And mm -hmm. that makes sense given the time frame that he's, you know, basically living in because 1910 New Orleans is not going to be an easy time for a black gay man. I was going to say, I, I, th th that's the other big change is we, we, have, we have changed Louis's race to a black man. But I think that adds so many interesting extra layers to the narrative. Mm, 100%. And I was excited and very trepidatious about doing this you know obviously we're gonna have a bunch of people who are very upset by it and they can go <laughs> fuck themselves yeah but i was impressed with how the show both acknowledges race but also doesn't make everything about race like we have a bunch of discriminatory attitudes about him being a business owner and when he tries to you know climb that business ladder and interject himself on the social scene in new orleans there's a lot of people who say like oh maybe you need to go back to your side of town but the narrative also changes when we introduce claudia and all of a sudden then they become the weirdos so it's less about race even though it's obviously still about race yeah this is not colorblind casting no and i i just think they're really smart with the way that they're dealing with a variety of issues be it race be it queerness be it even class right like because mm -hmm. at the end of the day they're rich vampires. They're well, and he's a rich black vampire, <laughs> mm -hmm. which I love. I oh, love I that. mean, again, there's so much catharsis from the way what they have to do to some of these white businessmen in this show. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I, so I watched the first couple of episodes maybe three or four months ago. I was doing a side project where I do reaction videos with Conrad from Movie Oubliette. Uh -huh. of folks, keeping ear slash eye out for that hopefully it'll drop sometime this year but we practiced with the first two episodes of this show because we hadn't really seen it and i had completely forgotten until i went back for this more recent rewatch yeah like we're killing members of the clergy in the first episode we're killing that businessman in the second episode and then we're just killing all of the important members of society in the finale uh one question for you did you think the passage of time was clear throughout the season so there were definitely a couple of times where it wasn't super clear to mm -hmm. the point where I wish we had done a little bit more. Give me a date stamp. Right. For the most part, I was able to follow it. But yeah, I, I think I even, you know, said earlier on this, oh, the, the span of the show is 30 years. I realize that's completely inaccurate because obviously, uh, well, we even yeah, get we're in the present saying, day. I'm like a hundred and whatever years. But so. the main story is like about 30 years of a gap. Yeah. So. There were a couple of times where it wasn't evident to me how long they had been living on this one street in New Orleans right. because, like, you can't stay there forever and not age. Like, I, I was happy we addressed it in the finale because we do see a couple of characters who have been around and they're quite a bit older. Like, their solicitor who they end up murdering as one of the people, mm -hmm. he's very clearly gotten older and he's like, you're weird. Like, yeah. this isn't right. <laughs> All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divert us again. So you, you mentioned you had issues with, um, with Sam Reed's accent as Lestat. So by <laughs> season's end, how did you feel about maybe not even Sam Reed's performance as Lestat, but let's say Lestat as a character and his arc in this series? I found he got more interesting as we went. Like, I latched on to Louis very early, and I was very much engaged with him. Mm -hmm. Just going to give a shout out again. Jacob Anderson. So good. So, so, so good, but so hot. Uh, uh, like, just yep. so hot. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and, and, he, and he's carrying the, I mean, he, he is the lead of this show. Oh, 100%. Yeah, Lestat is very much there, but this is Louis' show by right. far. Mm -hmm. But over the course of the seven episodes, I found that we we dug into Lestat and he becomes a tragic, almost pathetic, just far more complicated yes. character, particularly when Claudia gets into the mix and he he's just so reactionary. Like his defense mechanism when somebody else threatens how much Louis likes him mm -hmm. is like I just thought it was really well done. That's yeah. I, I think the like this version of Lestat. It's still like you can still see the Tom Cruise ness in this character. Sure, but yeah, they get to flesh him out so much more to the point where I do empathize with Lestat, mm -hmm. even though I can recognize he is a flawed, manipulative. Oh. I was gonna say human being, but I mean vampire. <laughs> um, it's because he reminds us of a lot of humans we know. Yeah, but in a way that I didn't really feel the same way about Tom Cruise's Lestat, because you know Tom Cruise's mm -hmm. Lestat. I mean, again, you only have two hours to do this, so he's kind of like this flamboyant, fun character. But the show gets to really dive into his psyche, and again, like mm -hmm. his problems. I love that he like tries to make things work, even though it's clearly against his nature. 
Yeah. And part of that is he can never be wrong. You know, I really enjoyed the chess match with him and yes. Claudia when uh-huh. we're deciding, okay, we're going to kill this dad. But also he is so narcissistic and full of himself that he thinks he will always win, whether it's in a game of chess or whether it's winning Louis back over the course of six years. And when Claudia and Louis get the better of him, it's really satisfying, but it's also... There's an air of tragedy to it. There really is. And especially when we can see it and Claudia can see it when Louis says, oh, no, we're not going to burn him. We'll just wrap his body up in carpet and take him to the dump. And everyone knows what's going on. It's like, (laughs) no, you just can't get rid of this guy because you are so fucking in love with him. My God, you know what? What a fucking queer romance to have. Dude, I know. Well, and again, like that's the thing too, because like with with Lestat's queerness uh, uh, being explicit, it's also like that feeds into his character too. You know, we don't know much about Lestat's, you know, first hundred or two, however old he is, you know, Mm-mm. pre-Louis life. But I, I kind of hope that's what we get from the second season is some flashbacks to his pre-vampire life. The, the right. moment where he finally tells Louis how he was turned is a mm-hmm. wonderful scene. And a really, really good performance from Reed, I think, in that moment. It's strong, strong agree. You know, there's a lot of flights of fancy about how great it is to be a vampire and how powerful they are. But particularly as we dig into how Lestat came to be and then we dance around it and i'll be curious to know if we get more but what happens to claudia when she goes off on her own with this other man yeah you know it's not like oh we're all powerful and we drink humans blood and we just you know soak up the night or whatever there's some really bad shit that happens to these people and i like that the show isn't afraid to dance in that darkness oh that's the thing I mean, as funny as the show is and it, it trust me there's plenty of humor so much in the funny show. yeah it's yeah but the horror still hits really hard and again the mm-hmm. tragedy hits really hard like, it, it, this show fires on all cylinders so well for most of its seven episodes to the point mm-hmm. where i didn't realize there were only seven episodes so when Ooh. that finale ended and <laughs> I, it, it, my, my Amazon Prime didn't just start the next episode. I was like, oh, I paid oh, no. $20 for this. Did I not get the full season? <laughs> <laughs> Where's episode eight? Where's episode nine and ten? What do you mean there's only seven episodes? Seven's Fuck. such a weird number. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a random number. But also, this to me, I mean... I don't fully understand how episode commitments work, particularly as Netflix has really changed the game. But seven is a very weird number. So it does seem like it's wrong. But I think in terms of the story that they're presenting over this first season, they knew expertly how to break up these episodes, how to build these arcs, and then how to end the season in a way that absolutely wants us just begging for more. I mean, yeah, you end this season, you're like, all right, season two, let's go. Like, start it right now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm so happy with the fact that I don't have to wait. I can't believe people have been waiting for more than a year. (laughs) Well, that's the thing. I, I I didn't really look too much at viewership numbers, but I didn't I didn't hear a lot of like buzz outside of critics. You know, this was a critically acclaimed first season, and it made mm-hmm. it on plenty of top ten lists. But I didn't know if it made a big splash with viewers. Although maybe it's kind of a CW situation where like because of the extremely positive critical reception and potential awards buzz, mm-hmm. they're like, no, we're gonna hold on to this golden cow. I feel like I remember that at least the first episode did quite well, but, you know, that's fairly commonplace. It's a buzzy title. It's an established IP. Anne Rice died, I want to say, last year. So it was kind of a, ooh, you know, this is a big thing. We're going to get a couple of Anne Rice shows. Mm. But compared to the reception of this and something like Mayfair Witches, which people did not see i think that show has its fans but they renewed that too which is they did interesting maybe they're just really signing on to oh my god is this our generation's it's our generation but like this generation's (laughs) true blood (laughs) quite possibly i mean my god if true blood was this consistently enjoyable that show would have been way better i know and y'all look first season of true blood fantastic um rest of the season's wildly up and down in quality (laughs) <laughs> truly that yeah um i will go up for season two with all of my heart but it's mostly just because i love that villain oh and you know what I- i'm the same way with season four people hate the witch season of season four but i love it because it's fiona shaw as the villain which i love right mm. no anyway. there's always good things about it but i mean coming back to interview yes. the vampire the level of consistency like this was so carefully plotted and mm-hmm. executed and well cast like that i think is why i'm so intrigued by bailey bass getting recast for somebody else and i don't know if it was just 
she doesn't look convincingly the age we need the actor to be anymore, or if it was something else behind the scenes. I tried to dig into it, and it wasn't clear what happened here. Yeah, they haven't. So it's interesting. Before I watched the show, I just assumed it was like, oh, yeah, it's a kid, so she's mm-hmm. going to age out, so they're just going to recast her every season until they kill. I mean, I'm right. assuming they kill off the character. They might okay. throw us a curveball. Which I would be very open for because what they've done with Claudia is also extremely fantastic. A hundred percent agreed. But it, yeah, I, 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 but they age Claudia up. So she's more mm-hmm. of a teenager in she's this like version. She's like 15, 16, I want to say. But even the way she composes herself, the way that she dresses up, you know, there's that really uncomfortable scene where when she decides, okay, I've hit my 18th birthday, even though I'm still in this child's body, I'm going to start dressing older. And she gets mocked by people on the street. But then after that, you actually do see her sort of settle into a fashion sense that works for her that is older than what she looks, but is actually a bit more appropriate for her actual age. Yeah, and just speculating here, but because no reason has been given for the casting change, mm-hmm. and because of the, the, the Bailey Bass did get rave reviews for her performance, I don't She's think it was so an acting good. thing. I, I'm actually choosing to believe it might have been a personal decision on Bass's part, and maybe it's just something that, that, that it's private. It's a private life thing that they don't want to no, they don't want to come out with. That, that, that's what I'm going to speculate. But again, who knows? Because no answer has been given. No, no. But I, I, I think the instinct is that AMC fired her. I, I don't think that's what happened, but who knows? I think the reason that people have gone in that direction is because she was so well received and right. she was a fan favorite that people can't understand why would you let this actor go? Yeah. Um, but OK, so, so how about this finale then? Right. So we the finale is basically a big old bloodbath. Mm hmm. So we have this Mardi Gras party where they're going to do their big finale before they leave New Orleans. And they are going to have a lavish Mardi Gras party and kill everyone there. And mm-hmm. they do. And they do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're we're bearing the lead at the end of episode six. Claudia and Louis decide telepathically because we can exclude Lestat from plans that. that way that they are going to kill him. So the whole finale is building up to this. Will he catch them or will they manage to pull it off? But of course, we also know it's Lestat. Like you're not actually going to kill him because then there's no show. Mm-hmm. So I was so curious how this was all going to play out. Well, and, and again, I'm sitting here like, cool, I got one, maybe three more episodes left of this show. So this is like a <laughs> before or the third act thing uh mm. yeah it's just really satisfying to see like a bunch of side characters end up getting involved so that we can kill them off but also i love a fucking heist or we've got to execute okay. a plan kind of episode Thank and you. that's what this is i'm so glad you used the word heist because that is exactly i was like this is like an ocean's 11 with vampires yeah yeah <laughs> And we've not really talked about Antoinette, who was played by Maura Grace uh, Thari. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she's kind of a, a tertiary character. She's in the background for a lot of this. She's emblematic of how Lestat gets what he wants and how he just compulsively lies. But I did love how we brought her in as part of Lestat's counter heist against yes. Claudia and Louis. Because it was very satisfying to just see Claudia be like, yeah, bitch, I clocked you at every point when you thought you were tracking me. <laughs> and remind me, refresh my memory, we kill Antoinette finally, right? Yes, we do. So Claudia stakes her through the heart, but it doesn't seem to kill her. And then we bury her body. And that's when we should be burning Lestat, but we don't. We sure should don't. And actually, my favorite beat in this was that Bogosia and Daniel Malloy is like, you didn't burn his body. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because Daniel Malloy understands everything that's going on. One of my favorite elements about this character, because, again, it could have been so fucking boring, is that he is challenging Louis at so many different points. Like, he's the one who brings up the unevenness of the racial connotations Uh where it's like a white master and a black slave or yeah yes no so that's is like where christian slater is like meant to be the audience surrogate in that film and that's kind of what daniel malloy is here but he already knows Mm -hmm. way more than we do because he's had this experience before but he also acts as the audience mouthpiece like the the, Mm -hmm. the the second he addresses the racial issues in their relationship i was like i was literally just thinking that yep and then you say it it's Uh perfect timing 
Well, and even when Louis takes Lestat back, he says, like, do you realize that you were in an abusive relationship? Yes. Like, do you realize you were being gaslit by this man? And he's like, you don't understand. And it's just like, no, Daniel Malloy definitely does understand. He's a fucking asshole a lot of the times, but he also calls it like he sees it. Yeah. Do you think we're going to take this character in the same route where, like, he wants to become a vampire? I, I at least like that. Mm. I mean, I like it. Because the Parkinson's to me is like, that's the road we're going on, right? Like, bite me, turn me so I can be cured. Or maybe it'll be like a thing where he realizes quickly, like, no, this is not the life I want. Like, maybe this version of Daniel Malloy will take the lesson from Louis' story. Mm, I do think we're leaning a little bit more towards that because there's one brief interaction where we acknowledge his disease, but he talks about how he's old. And I I took it to be a coded version of, I wouldn't want to have eternal life considering I'm now old like this. Yes. Yeah. That, I mean, who knows at this point? Mm hmm. Okay. So let's talk about where we leave off because... I'm going to call this a gentle cliffhanger because I think to casual viewers, the reveal that Rashid, the quote unquote manservant who's been present the entire series, is actually Armand and is actually Louis' lover and a huge main character in the books. I was like, oh, I think this is a big reveal. But as a casual fan, like somebody who's not read the books, who's only watched the movie once, this was like, oh, interesting. I yeah. think for other people, this was a gasp clutch your pearls moment i agree with you and that's part of the reason why i didn't think it was the finale when i finished the episode because <laughs> i was like oh mm -hmm. it's it this feels like a really good episode ending cliffhanger but like it doesn't feel fully like a season cliffhanger mm -hmm. i did like the way it was teased out where you know at the end of episode six daniel malloy wakes up from this dream where he thinks he's seen rashid from that first meeting with louis in uh -huh. the gay bar back in the 70s and you're like wait no but i I thought Rashid was just a human. Oh, yeah. I'm getting it. <laughs> I guess that that's the other part of it. Even if you don't know who Armand is, that reveal is still a pretty good one. Because honestly, yeah. the implication here is that Louis has been under Armand's spell for decades. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he, he traded out one toxic relationship for another, even though we don't really know what this relationship is like yet. No, all we hear is Louis say, the love of my life, which is wild because we have spent seven episodes watching what we thought was the love of his life that's why he couldn't kill the stat so how do we get from that relationship to this one well and that's why i think in the second season so obviously we're going to be getting a lot of the backstory with armand which is mm -hmm. going to tie into claudia's potential demise yeah if we do follow the trajectory which i think we're going to have to because i think the, so too the show knows enough that fans are happy with some of the changes that they've made, but also they still want to see the developments from the books. But for the most part, I mean, again, I, I just think it walks this wonderful, delicate balancing act of, yeah, being faithful while adding new things to the story, which mm -hmm. are just all very interesting. Oh my god. It's called This Is How You Do It. We have this IP and we want to remake it because if not, it's just sitting there. Like, you don't just do the same thing. You update it, you make it fresh, but also you put your own stamp on it. This show is such a great example of how to do a contemporary adaptation. Absolutely. And that's the thing too, yeah, we're, we're, we're setting this, you know, the present stuff in the actual present. We're not back mm -hmm. in the 90s. No, no. Okay, so two other things. So we do have Delaney Hales taking over as Claudia. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really have much more to say about that, except I'm intrigued to see how this is going to go. Yeah, I'm the same way. I mean, I, I'm I, while I, I do lament the, the loss of Bailey Bass, I mean, I have to believe that they would cast someone who is just as good as her in a recast. <laughs> one would hope, one would hope. But then there's one other casting announcement that has come out. So I imagine we'll get to see quite a bit more of Armand now that we know who he actually is. Mm -hmm. But Trace, the other person who's coming in is Ben Daniels as Santiago. Adding queerness to the mix, huh? Oh my god, I love Ben Daniels so fucking much. I didn't realize i i didn't know about this until we were prepping for this episode where i mm -hmm. saw the casting notice on wikipedia yeah and i was just like oh my god yes it's well because this is the stephen ray character from the film right uh yes yes i believe so and he's a very flamboyant over-the-top character he doesn't have a lot to do in the film mm -hmm. but i'm again with ben daniels who i i really only know from that extras tv series um yeah 
I'm excited to see what he can do with a very different type of role. Assuming this is the, they, they kind of keep the same, like, flamboyant at this character. Flamboyant, mischievous, yeah. Uh, I'm intrigued to see how or if Armand is going to show up in the past compared to how he's portrayed in the present. But yeah, I mean, I also imagine we're going to move the action out of New Orleans and over to Europe because that's where a lot of this story takes place. Yes, I do wonder too. So like, because this first season was very much about, you know, oh, the toxic relationship between Lestat and Louis and then their, you know, their their surrogate family with Claudia. Mm -hmm. If it's going to kind of be a same thing, but it's, oh, it's Armand instead of Lestat in the second season. But then my question is, well, how much of a role will Lestat and Sam Reed have in the second season? Exactly. It's a huge question mark, right? I mean, you don't spend a full season building this character up and then say, oh, well, I guess we'll only have him show up for half an episode and, or something. And, and that's kind of what happens in the movie, right? So after mm-hmm. Claudia and Louis kill Lestat, we get one appearance from Lestat in a mausoleum and then the very end when he gets Daniel Malloy. Right. Yeah. And that's not going to satisfy. That's no, not going to work. No, no. Could you imagine if they wait the whole season and just reintroduce Lestat in the finale? Oh, people would be irate. <laughs> I would be irate. <laughs> I I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, overall, like, I, I'm really happy we watched this. Um, this is better than I could have imagined, even mm-hmm. given the glowing reception it had last uh, when it when it premiered. No, yeah. I mean, I thought that this was very well received by people who liked the book. And I thought, good for them. They finally got the adaptation that yeah. they've been looking for. Fuck me. We're not jumping on this earlier because I should have known better. I agree. And y'all, if, I mean, if you haven't watched this and you made it all the way through these spoilers, I mean, it's only seven episodes. Like, I, I binge this in a weekend. Oh, it's so bingeable. Like, I dare you past episode three to yeah. stop and not want to hit play in the next one. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, everyone. Well, I mean, that has been Interview with the Vampire season one. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so, you know, um, we we will be giving our thoughts on season two in some shape, way or form. But um, until then, I mean, let's cross out season one of Interview with the Vampire, Joe. There we go. Yes. And cross out horror queers. Horror queers.